In our journey through the four corners of Iceland, we find one man at the heart of it all. A father, a son, a skier, a sailor, and a captain. Known to many as a man who embodies the true spirit of Icelandic adventure. So my full name is Sigurður Jónsson. I'm 57 years old. My job title, I don't think I have one. A skipper. Could be one. I come from Isafjörður. It was a perfect place to grow up in. And it was everything, all our games were about the mountains or the sea. So we were either rowing on a little boat or sailing or messing around in the shipyard or somewhere up in the mountain skiing or camping and so I think all my life until my well until now almost have been something about the sea and the mountains. There was a lot of skiing in my family. My grandfather was uh, like raced and my uncle went to the Olympics and but I was maybe a little bit like my father that we were always skiing and around the skiing but never competitive racers or anything like that so I, I just remember going with my dad when I was really I, well some of my earliest memories were going with him but that was quite often maybe to go to a hut with some supplies for some campers or something like that rather than actually just racing or anything like that. But Isafjörður had skiers in pretty much every Olympic until just the last few months. We always had, there was always somebody from town who was in the national team and was going to the Olympics. So it was, Isafjörður was always a, the, one of the main ski towns in Iceland. I think it is, uh, sometimes it's a coincident culture. Or that if something grows out of a coincidence in the beginning and then it sticks. So there's many towns in Iceland that had maybe similar mountains. Like for instance here on the east coast, they somehow never had the same uh, deep-rooted culture of, of ski racing and things like that. But I think it started already in the 1930s. With, and it just, until today, it has a very strong culture of, of, of skiing and racing. And, not, and also, even before we had this new backcountry skiing things, you know, that, you know, people think that it's something new that has been going on in the last 10, 20 years. But it, like in town, it, it has been going on for, since I would say since the 1920s or the 30s that people just went up into the mountains and skied freely in the mountains. And it's a continuation of the same tradition, I think. My earliest memories of sailing or going, being on the water in one way is a little bit it's the same as with the mountains. So my dad had a small boat. He always had some kind of boat. When I was growing up, maybe he had a small motorboat and he would, I would go out with him and like for hunting birds and fishing. And then later he got a sailboat. He actually built his own sailboat and I got a little bit into that. So yeah, that, it has been a big part of my life always. But I was never a professional fisherman or a, or a sailor as such. I, was a, I did a few trips, but mostly I was working in a shipyard. I was around boats in one way or the other, but not, I was never really much of a fisherman or anything like that, like half the town was. I think already in my teenage years, I, I decided that I wanted to, have to get an education that had something to do with boats. And then I got summer jobs when I was a teenager in the shipyard and I started working in the shipyard and then that led to me going to university and studying uh, naval architecture.
All my life I had my eyes on the outdoors. Maybe I'm just such a childish person. I mean, I just want to be playing outdoors. I just love to go and play outdoors. And in the back of my head, I had this idea. Maybe one day I could somehow make this a job. But I had a serious, normal job in, in shipbuilding and ship design and ship operations. I met a couple of guys, British guys, legendary, <laughs> each of their own field somehow. So Sir Robin Knox Johnston, who was a, a sailor, and Chris Bonington, who was a kind of a famous mountaineer. And they were there on a sailing boat, had been trying to get to Greenland, and we started chatting, and they were like my heroes, my childhood heroes. And, and during one of our, or we were just sitting having beer and curry on board, and, and Robin said, you know, this boat is for sale, why don't you take her and start your business yourself? And I said, yeah, okay, that's kind of funny. And, but that was kind of the, what triggered it. I went home and I started, yeah, why not? Maybe this is an opportunity to do this. And it may not be the perfect boat, but it's a good size and we can make it work. And I, I had, a, I got a couple of friends with me and we started looking at if this could make some kind of business sense, which probably never did, but in, enough that we uh, decided to buy this boat. So that's in uh, 2005. And from the beginning, we decided that we were not gonna really develop anything new as such. We were just going to go and do our things, you know, do things that we liked and we, that we had enjoyed for a long, long time ourselves and just see if somebody was interested in coming and doing the same thing. It was like we, we just wanted to invite people to our home almost and just go out and play with us. Actually, our good friend uh, Jürgen Bergman did the, the first ski trip with us in the spring of 2006. And he came back on many trips after that until he got stuck up in the air with all his uh, helicopters and uh, he's done a wonderful career with that and a great business after that. But that kicked it off. Uh, we started sailing and skiing. In the beginning, it was more like a summer job but slowly that consumed the whole, my whole life somehow and I, I kind of left the shipbuilding world behind and just continue with uh, sailing, and, sailing and skiing and then again it combined these two things, the ocean and the mountains. Through the years I've met so many wonderful people on my boats and on, on my trips and I think what most of them have in common is just some kind of a not necessarily a quest for adventure but somehow just an honest quest for just going and play outside in the nature I mean they may be skiers but they also enjoy being on the boat but they also want to ask about the, the culture they want to have you know, eat the local fish, and they want to know what's going on with the fishing industry. So it's, it's. I think it's like common with most of these people is 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 just curiosity about the world and people, and want to be with other people in the nature. Without any particular strategy, I think we built, ended up building a bit of a community around our boats. People kept coming back and back and back, and, and uh, you know. And now I get phone calls from these people all the time, and they're always asking, "Hey, when are you going to go skiing again? Can we come with you? We don't care where you want to go. We just want to go with you on your boat. You know, can we go to Svalbard? Can we go to Russia? Can we go to somewhere? You know." We just want to go wherever you want to go and continue this uh, connection. I 
oh, it's giving me, well, it's giving me so much to, to be part of this community somehow. Uh, I mean, I don't think, I'm not sure if I, maybe I was a bit of an instigator or, you know, but I, I'm not, it's not created by me. It's some kind of a co-creation, co you know, it's something that happens when you, when you put these people together. It's not, I mean, I may have facilitated and provided the platform, but it's like some magic happens that is, is out of my control. Last week I had, had a group of, of friends uh, who have been with me many times before and, and they have actually, that's, that, that was the first group that was with when we had the, uh, our girl on board a few years ago and, and they almost insist that we want, we want to make sure the girls are here, the, li the little girls, you know, we want to have them on board and we want to see the family and so I think it's it's a, it's a one, it's like a big family in a way. Many, many things have happened through the years with me. And I mean, I started with our Artica, but two years ago, I left that somehow. I don't have that, any connection to that anymore. And, and, uh, and now it's more like, it's now it's just me and the family. It's me, me and Arnoka, and our girls and and it's it's much less of a business now you know and maybe it was never really such a good business but at least it was we had we had hired people we I was hiring captains and I, the people were working for me and it was like a little bit more and there was a lot of these individual bookings and things like that it was a proper tourist company now we are more or less just sailing pleasure cruise with friends and family. It's a new thing and we are still thinking, a little bit thinking about, you know, where it's gonna go next. I think what we like, both of us, Anuk and I, is that we like to develop something new. We run, like to run these kind of pilot projects and maybe do some special charter expeditions and science related projects. It grows from the same roots, but it's, uh, it's still a new thing and it, it has gone yeah, I, 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 I enjoy that it doesn't, it doesn't have to follow some kind of a logical route. That it, and I think maybe my life has been a little bit of a twist and turn and it doesn't always follow exactly the, the route. But uh, I like the way it's going now and I think I'm pretty excited about where it's going to end. My name is Annuka Pekkarinen. I grew up in Finland. Yeah, so our family never had a sailboat, but I grew up in a town where we had this um, association, like a traditional sailing association, and the whole concept of that association was to take kids out to the sea who I had no other chance basically to do it, just to get them somehow interested in the sea and in the nature. And so we were sailing on the boat during the day and we slept in tents and it was somehow really this kind of powerful experience and I think it got a lot of kids in the town interested in the marine everything basically. <laughs> like most of the people who I sailed there, they ended up in becoming captains or marine engineers or or marine biologists like me, basically. Um, that's how it started. I think it's really important that if you want to live this kind of life that you start it right away when the kids are really, really small because then they grow up. Here they get used to the environment, they get used to the movement of the boat and how to be on a boat. I think it would be a lot harder to start when they are like in school age or something like that. So it's just kind of a growing into it together as a couple. We have been kind of wondering that if they grow up like this, that maybe when they're teenagers they will just want to go and do their own thing. They will never step on a sailboat again. <laughs> Who knows?
up to that, so up to them to decide. <laughs> I mean, up until now, we have been, of course, lots in both of our home places in a way. So we have sailed in around Sigis hometown and we have sailed around Baltic Sea. I think the main driver is somehow trying to do things and go to places where a lot of people don't normally go to. I actually think that the best thing about sailing on sailing ships is the community or the kind of feeling that you are in a boat with 10, 12 people. And it's a really special kind of connection because you live so close to each other. You get to know good sides and the bad sides of everyone where you're in some kind of a tight setting. I don't think you really get to know a person properly until you are in some kind of a situation that is like unknown to them. That's when you really see how they act and how they, you know, how they react. And mostly, of course, we do really, really nice things, but it is in a way an adventure to be in this kind of small boat together with a very tight crew. And I think people get to know a lot of things about themselves and uh, the other people get to know them really well. So, when you let go, it's gonna come pretty quickly, so don't hold on to the rope. Like, uh, you know, just let it go. And uh, open the coil before. Open the coil. So the girls are, have been with us since they were born, basically. And of course, they also have a more normal life in Finland where they go to kindergarten and, you know. But I think, I, what I hope that they will learn from this and take from this is the, is the respect for the nature and our environment, but also for other people. I think that is really important for all of us to get a better understanding of how we can live in harmony or as part of the nature. There's no doubt in my mind that the climate is changing. And it's changing because of us. That's our, our fault. I think it is inevitable that we should stop wasting fossils by burning them. These fossils are not ours to waste. I mean, they belong to my little girls and their grandkids. There's no logic that, you know, one or like two or three generations should be allowed to waste away, you know, millions and millions of years of fossils. It's two things. It's the changing climate, but it's also the intergenerational justice, which I think is equally important. And even if the fossil burning was not changing the climate, it, we should still not waste it. We don't have, we shouldn't be allowed to do it. We need to do everything in our power to stop wasting fossil fuel. It's so bad for everything. It's horrible for international politics, you know, the geopolitics, it's, it's a horrible thing. It's a toxic thing for everyone. And uh, I mean, we, we just need to stop. We need to stop wasting this.
Island is a bit spoiled in a way that we have already done the first energy transition in a way that we don't, the, there's no fossil fuel wasted for heating houses or generating power at all. But we are left with the transportation. That means that I am burning diesel on this boat. I'm really ashamed of it. It's a horrible thing that I'm actually doing it, but I'm still doing it. I don't, just don't, I can't fix it right away, but I, 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 I will. But it's like, we need to find ways to get our local energy into our boats and our cars and our ships and our airplanes. And this is what we are working on now. Iceland has made a commitment to, to, to make this transition, you know, in less than 20 years. And that's a gigantic challenge. But it's something we need to do and we should be doing. This is a big thing. You know, it's not about individuals buying a Tesla or something. It's a, it's a major political strategic decision that we need the full weight of the whole, you know, government and the whole, everything, the system behind this. And it's not about us, you know, little people uh, changing bulbs and houses and stuff. We're talking about much bigger thing. I have never looked at skiing as a sport. I never thought of myself participating in any sport at all. In my mind, skis were just a vehicle to go and do something, you know, to get to a place. I mean, just being outside and with any means needed, skis or climbing and ice climbing, it's just giving me everything really. It's just, uh, I think it has shaped a lot just who I am and I'm, Hoping I can pass a little bit on to my kids. I think the worst thing anybody could do is to try to teach others how to live their life. But I do think that it's important that we believe that we are masters of our own faith. We are not just blowing in the wind. We can do what we want. But if there's anything I want to stress and one of my put my weight behind it's this big picture of a better world and I think the, the stopping the fossil fuel is it's such a good focal point of this battle I, I just I want to go on a little bit of a pirate mission and just fight this bullshit you know we should not be wasting this it, it there's so many good things that come together if we could eliminate the reliance on, on the fossil fuels. It's the, it's the better, it's a better climate, it's the better justice between, like the intergenerational justice, the geopolitics are going to change, you know, so it has endless benefits. This is the, the most important thing that any one of us could be doing these days. <laughs>